kalau boleh saya kita langsung saja panggilkan para panelis yang akan menjadi pembicara. Duduk di depan boleh. Oke, okay. uh, yang pertama adalah uh, Dr. Heather Mary Schmidt dari WHO. Yes, boleh duduk di depan. Ini saya ngomongnya bahasa apa ya? Sunda atau Indonesia? <laughs> yang kedua adalah um, ini ibu atau mbak ya? Ayu Oktariani, enak ya? Dede, kakak ya? Kak Ayu, silakan Kak Ayu. Kak Ayu ini dari um, Ikatan Perempuan Positif Indonesia. Yang ketiga adalah Dr. Resti Indriyatmi, as spesialis kulit dan kelamin. Silakan dong, boleh duduk di depan. Baik. Um, sesi ini akan berlangsung sampai pukul pukul 12. Sesi ini akan berlangsung sampai pukul 12 karena ada sesi berikutnya ya, Bu Ines. Uh, jadi kita akan coba untuk strik, saya akan coba memoderatori supaya kita bisa tepat waktu. Uh, setiap pembicara nanti akan diberikan waktu maksimal 10 menit ya. Dokter, kakak, uh, dan Bu Heather. Uh, kemudian saya akan memberikan uh, apa namanya pengingat ketika nanti sudah masuk lima uh, menit kelima. Terus kemudian nanti kalau sudah tinggal dua menit lagi, gitu ya. Jadi mohon izin dulu sebelumnya. Dan kemudian sesudah uh, paparan tiga paparan, kita akan masuk pada sesi tanya jawab yang akan dibuka dalam bentuk termin. Nanti kita lihat sesuai waktunya ya. Apakah bisa dua atau tiga termin? Itu setiap termin nanti tiga penanya. Oke, kalau sudah siap, kita langsung saja mulai dengan yang pertama dari Dr. Heather Mary Schmidt dari WHO. Um, yang saya akan persilahkan untuk membawakan paparannya. Untuk sebelumnya mungkin bisa memperkenalkan diri. Please introduce yourself before you begin your presentation. Presentasi. Uh, presentasinya apakah sudah ada di panitia? Sudah. Bisa langsung ditayangkan? Ya. Presentasinya boleh ditayangkan nggak ya? Operatornya di mana ya? Iya. On it, on it. There on it. Mungkin uh, sebelumnya you could uh, introduce yourself because we are waiting for the presentation slide to be presented. Selamat pagi, nama saya Heather Marie Schmidt. Pagi. I am the regional advisor for PrEP, co-funded by WHO and UNAIDS. I'm based in Bangkok. And um, by way of background, I was a senior policy analyst and prep focal person in the New South Wales government in Australia, working on the Epic New South Wales trial. Epic New South Wales, in two years, enrolled almost 10,000 people onto prep. And I do have one slide, so I won't preempt the results, but um, it, it, it's really startling what happened. Ini ada ada penerjemahnya atau ada, yang lain pasti ngerti semua kan ya? Oh iya paham. <laughs> Kalau nanti saya minta dokter Nurlan bantu terjemah. <laughs> Maksudnya untuk audiensnya tadi kan beliau bicara ngomong bahasa Inggris. Tapi kita paham lah ya. Oke. Okay. Oh, presentasi oke. Okay. Delivered. 
So starting with what is PrEP? PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis, and it's an HIV prevention strategy in which people without HIV take an oral retroviral drug before exposure to HIV to reduce their risk of infection. Um, some people think of PrEP a little bit like the female contraceptive pill, um, but it protects against HIV rather than pregnancy. It's safe and it's effective and it's very easy to prescribe for the majority of patients. WHO recommends the drug used contains tenofovir, and usually countries use tenofovir with antracitabine or tenofovir with lamivudine. WHO currently recommends that PrEP is taken daily, although other regimes do exist, including Avendrib and PrEP. Uh, next slide. So I was asked also to address PEP very briefly, and my key message here is that PrEP is not PEP, despite the fact that they sound very, very similar. PEP is post-exposure prophylaxis. I'm sorry, there is a typo on my slide. Um, and it's a prevention strategy in which people take antiretroviral drugs after exposure to HIV to reduce their risk. It must be commenced within 72 hours and taken for 28 days post-exposure. PEP for people with occupational and non-occupational exposures is an important additional tool that many countries don't really list within their um, comprehensive uh, package of HIV services. As I mentioned, oral PrEP containing tenofovir um, is recommended by the WHO, and it's recommended to be offered as an additional HIV prevention choice for people at substantial risk. Based on, it's a strong recommendation based on high quality evidence. And the reason that it's based on this evidence is PrEP is effective when it's taken. So there's very high evidence um, that PrEP efficacy is highly correlated with PrEP adherence, and the WHO, oh sorry, thank you. <laughs> So WHO, US CDC, and others recognize that PrEP has over 90% efficacy based on per protocol analyses. And recent studies like Epic New South Wales have shown efficacy as um, high as 99% when taken daily. It is highly effective. So who is PrEP for? Um, based on the evidence from clinical trials and other studies, in 2015, WHO recommended oral PrEP as part of as an additional prevention choice for any person at substantial risk of HIV as part of a comprehensive program, prevention program, which includes HIV testing, links to treatment, which we know is highly effective in preventing onward transmission, condoms, harm reduction interventions, and etc. It's really critical to note that this recommendation is not population specific. It's really about being at substantial risk for HIV infection. Populations at risk for substantial HIV infection are provisionally defined as an incidence of 3% or, or greater. And basically people in key populations are the most likely to benefit from PrEP. But PrEP is not appropriate for everyone. So, PrEP eligibility, um, WHO has helped define the people most likely to be at substantial risk of infection. Of course, to be taking PrEP, you need to be HIV negative. Um, but <coughs> other criteria include, and sorry, this is a bit difficult to see on the slide, um, but having a sexual partner, being in a serious quadrant relationship with a partner who does not, uh, is not virally suppressed, or being sexually active in a high HIV incidence of prevalent population and having vaginal or anal sex without condoms with more than one partner or a sexual partner with more than one risk factor, a history of an STI, um, use of post-exposure prophylaxis, um, or requesting PrEP. And requesting PrEP was recommended by WHO for a very important reason. And that's that it can be very difficult to disclose your HIV risk factors that might make you eligible for PrEP. And so for that reason, it's really important that people who ask for PrEP 
um, that, that it is offered from the WHO point of view. Contraindications, of course, you can't be HIV positive, PrEP is not treatment, even <coughs> though they use a, a, the same drug. Um, things like renal function, not having an acute infection, um, and not being allergic to the medication. But why do we need PrEP in Indonesia? The simple message to that is, as we've already heard, um, PrEP is an additional prevention tool, and there's already a massive prevention gap. Condom promotion alone is simply not working. And that's not unique to Indonesia. That's in many places in the world. So we need to do something more. And we know that PrEP is really highly effective. Um, we also know that the vast majority of people don't know their status. About a third are on treatment. We need to do more overall. There are too many people at risk for HIV. Um, and I will skip most of this, but just to say that HIV prevalence <coughs> is high among key populations. Um, and for the epidemic overall, we're really, projections suggest that the, that the epidemic is stagnating with what's currently being done. We need something additional. So one of the major concerns that clinicians, the community, government have about PrEP is whether PrEP um, what effect does PrEP have on STIs and on condoms? Uh, so a systematic meta-analysis was published um, just <coughs> earlier this year, um, and it looked at a total of over it looked at a total of over 4,000 participants. None of the looking at condom use, none of the studies found a significant increase in the proportion of men who have sex with men reporting condomless sex between baseline and follow-up. So no change, no significant change on condom use. But it did suggest that where there was change, it was mostly concentrated amongst the people that were already at much higher risk. Um, so they go from infrequent condom use to never um, using condoms. But some studies, like a trial of over 1,300 sex workers in India, found that the change there was no change in condom use and that adherence to PrEP was very high. Looking at STIs then, um, the meta-analysis did find that there was an increase in STIs between baseline and increase in, in any STIs between baseline and um, follow-up, but we also need to remember that this is in a context of a worldwide increase in STIs overall, um, and that studies and population-wide implementation, there hasn't been an explosion of STIs. So in places like Australia, where we've had almost over 17,000 people on PrEP, we haven't had the STI again. Um, there has been no explosion. Um, and many people taking PrEP do not ever get an STI. So we can expect that there might be an increase, though. And the increased number of infections can relate to increased STI testing. We would expect that as people are testing more, we're going to find more infections. Um, and more frequent STI testing and partner notification can lead to a reduced STI transmission. And modeling is showing that, which is really good. The better engagement we have, the, the lower the transmission. And there's no evidence, really critically, that um, to indicate that PrEP, the effectiveness of PrEP, is influenced at all by having an STI. So, what happens on a population scale when you implement PrEP? What are the opportunities for Indonesia? So, Epic New South Wales, which is the program I was part of before, um, started enrollment in March 2016, and it was a PrEP access program. It was designed as a public health intervention for people who are at high risk of HIV. Um, it was a joint initiative by government, by clinicians and researchers in the community. Everybody was intimately involved in this. And initially it en aimed to enroll 3,700 people, um, but quickly exceeded that and almost enrolled 10,000 people by the time the, uh, the program closed <coughs> and national rollout began um, earlier this year. Comparing the 12 months before Epic New South Wales, um, started enrollment to the 12 months after the first 3,700 people were enrolled, there was a 32% reduction in recent HIV infections. Um, and although the reduction in new, um, no, let me, 
Although there was a reduction in no um, it, in infections with no evidence of recent infection, what you'd expect from PrEP is that the, the effect should be the greatest in recent infections because it's preventing new infections. Two minutes. Okay. So it's a similar picture in um, central London um, where five, in, since 2015 there's been an 80% reduction in diagnoses. And in San Francisco, who began enrollment, uh, who began rollout of PrEP in 2012, and since then has aggressively promoted it as part of testing and treatment, um, and there's been an enormous effect on the epidemic. So is, pre is PrEP more than just a pill? Yes, absolutely. We do not give PrEP and tell people to go away and come back when it's, when it's better. PrEP is a gateway for sexual health services for key populations. It's a package that includes regular HIV testing. It includes prime studying PrEP, things like creatinine, hepatitis B testing, which also be offered. Um, because PrEP poses the drug resistance if a person has undetected HIV, when starting or restarting PrEP, um, HIV testing is really important. And because PrEP is also only appropriate for people who are HIV negative. And just like with HIV treatment, support should be offered, including adherence counselling. Particularly because, as I mentioned, PrEP efficacy is highly dependent on adherence. Um, I'm just going to skip over this, but this is essentially how PrEP should be offered um, and the, the example of the services that should be offered. One good point is that the side effects are pretty mild. PrEP is highly safe and effective. Um, and the final thing that I probably just wanted to, to mention is that building demand is really critical among the community for scale-up and to achieve the population level benefits of PrEP. It's important for clinicians, for the community to raise awareness about colleague, uh, PrEP among your colleagues and help counter misinformation because one of the dangers is that people have the wrong information about PrEP. There is already demand there for PrEP. People are willing to take it, they want to take it, and they're starting to take it. It's being accessed online, people are going to Bangkok. Um, so I think we need to start realizing that this is already there, even if it's not part of a national program. Um, so PrEP is being rolled out across the globe. In Asia Pacific, this is from uh, mid-2018, and it's already rapidly changing. There's already national rollouts starting in Thailand. In Vietnam, they've announced national rollout. There are trials beginning in Nepal, Cambodia, and Malaysia, in addition to the trials that are already seen here. And there are additional proposals for phased rollout because we have the evidence. We don't need more trials. We know PrEP works. It's really about starting it and making sure it's working in your context. Indonesia has the opportunity to take a leading role in providing PrEP in such a populous and complex environment. So, final messages. PrEP is highly effective for preventing, prep, uh, for preventing HIV when used as prescribed. Rapid scale-up can significantly reduce new infections. WHO <laughs> recommends it. Um, as part of a combination HIV response, testing, treating, preventing, we can all end HIV together. Um, PrEP does not prevent against pregnancy or STIs, unfortunately. Um, so we need to deliver it as part of a package. And the current epidemic in Indonesia is not increasing. PrEP could be the additional tool to help reduce infections among people who are at high risk. Okay. Terima kasih. Thank you, Dr. Heather Mary Schmidt. Uh, langsung kita berikan kesempatan kedua kepada Ayu. Boleh sebelum sambil menunggu presentasi diperkenalkan dulu pakai tari tarian juga boleh. <laughs> Selamat siang Bapak Ibu semua teman-teman yang ada di ruangan ini. Uh, mohon maaf saya harus di atas karena kalau di sini saya kehalangan podium. Uh, ya, yeah. ya. Yeah. Uh, nama saya Ayu Oktariani. Uh, saat ini saya uh, banyak membantu teman-teman di Ikatan Perempuan Positif Indonesia. Uh, Uh, hari ini saya akan uh, bercerita sebenarnya, saya tidak paparan yang begitu saintifik, kebanyakan uh, based on experience dan apa yang dijalani bersama-sama di uh, lapangan oleh teman-teman. 
uh, saya diminta menyampaikan tentang uh, betapa pentingnya sebenarnya pencegahan pada orang muda. Dan sebenarnya kalau ini dijalankan, harusnya saya bisa berdiri di sini tanpa harus terinfeksi HIV. Jadi kalau tindakan preventif dilakukan sejak uh, saya berada di bangku sekolah, mungkin saya tidak akan terinfeksi HIV, tapi nyatanya saya terinfeksi HIV, tapi nggak apa-apa. Udah 9 tahun, uh, baby lebih senior daripada saya. Boleh, next. Uh, oh, ini ya. Oke. Okay. Saya tidak bicara mewakili diri saya sendiri. Di Indonesia, orang muda itu Uh, baik dari mulai yang beresiko sampai yang kata orang less resiko Tapi menurut saya semua orang muda di dunia ini beresiko uh, Dari mulai anak jalanan, anak sekolah, sampai teman-teman yang memang masuk ke kategori populasi kunci Yang sempat kemudian menjadi uh, tanda tanya saat kemudian ada kelompok muda kunci muncul Mau ngapain gitu ya Padahal sebenarnya kita nggak ada yang Uh, speak out teman-teman populasi kunci muda itu kenapa kemudian ada teman-teman populasi kunci muda saat ini uh, oke okay. tinggal di Indonesia jadi orang muda itu susah banget ya, susah banget saya rasa nggak usah orang muda bapak ibu juga tinggal di Indonesia banyak challenge ya betul ya nah sebagai orang muda di Indonesia saya pribadi amat sangat merasakan sulitnya jadi orang muda di Indonesia saya punya banyak teman kawan Saudara yang tinggal di negara lain Begitu aksesibel untuk Dapat banyak banget informasi dan edukasi Untuk uh, melindungi dirinya Menjaga dirinya tetap sehat Menjadikan dirinya seseorang yang Berguna dan bermanfaat Saya pertama bicara teknologi atau tidak ada teknologi Zaman saya tidak ada teknologi Apakah itu baik? Tidak Kalau sekarang kita tinggal browsing Cari, tapi apakah itu baik? Enggak juga Jadi ada atau enggak ada teknologi Itu sebenarnya balik lagi sama kitanya di Indonesia tuh mau manfaat ini dengan benar atau enggak? Ternyata zaman saya nggak ada teknologi, kondisinya jadi lebih buruk. Gitu. <tuh> saya nggak bisa browsing apapun soal HIV. Yang saya dengar cuma dari tetangga, kawan, siapapun yang ngomongin HIV adalah uh, orang yang berperilaku buruk, <tuh> orang yang terinfeksi HIV adalah orang dengan moral yang tidak baik dan lain sebagainya. Kemudian tidak ada sex education di rumah dan di sekolah. Orang tua selalu bilang no, no, no. Tabu, gak boleh nanya Saya sekarang punya anak usia 11 tahun Anak saya terinfeksi HIV Kami berdua sama-sama minum ARV sudah 9 tahun PR saya adalah gimana caranya Ngebimbing anak saya Begitu pula teman-teman perempuan positif Yang punya anak Bukan cuma HIV, kita punya PR Berani gak kita kasih sex education? Saya berani Saya bilang sama anak saya, ini namanya vagina Bukan dompet Ini namanya penis, bukan burung Sampai saya dipanggil sama kepala sekolah, katanya anak saya ngomong jorok Itu sex education, padahal payudara, kuping, tenggorokan, telinga, sama sama payudara Organ tubuh betul begitu ya, dokter Ronald ya Ini dokter banyak banget di sini nih, saya masa aja, ini ya kan Patriarki dan religion issue Ini buat saya kental banget di Indonesia Hal yang harusnya jadi ranah personal, urusan pribadi masing-masing selalu diangkat-angkat Selalu dipermasalahkan jadi kalau jadi ada orang muda kayak saya, kayak Alexa, kayak teman-teman tiba-tiba speak out ngomongin, udah deh, udah bagus nggak dibangkat cint, <laughs> ya? Ini selalu jadi masalah terus menerus. Saat ada orang yang kemudian pengen uh, fight untuk kasih edukasi lebih, jadi selalu jadi tanda tanya. Kemudian parent rules to be respected, uh, anak-anak nggak uh, dapat kesempatan untuk berdiskusi tentang kebutuhan mereka. Itu juga masih jadi tantangan di Indonesia. Saya adalah orang tua muda, Mahmud, mamah mamah muda. Sampai hari ini saya terus belajar berdebat sama anak saya, tapi kelar urusannya. Ya, baby punya anak, udah gadis, udah punya cucu. Ya, dia lebih ekspor dari saya. Dan kita punya banyak teman-teman yang akhirnya belajar satu sama lain. Nih, gimana nih supaya anak-anak kita jangan sampai kayak kita, nggak dapat informasi apa apa. Orang tua harus jadi garda paling depan. Kalau sekolah nggak mau kasih edukasi seks, kita yang harus kasih. Itu tantangan terbesar. Ya, seks and drugs itu ada di mana-mana. Kita adalah makhluk biologis. Ya, ada kebutuhan di masa SMP jatuh cinta. Saya pertama kali berhubungan seks usia SMA. Ada yang ngasih tahu? Tidak ada satupun. Tidak ada yang ngegait, tidak ada yang memproteksi. Dan saya yakin begitu banyak orang muda di Indonesia yang melakukan hal serupa, termasuk drugs. Ya, kalau drugs mah, kalau saya nggak nyalain drugs usernya, coba. 
pemerintah gimana caranya supaya draksi jangan ada gitu bisa nggak susah kan jangan saya ngomong nanti saya dimarahin sama teman-teman PKMI ya kemudian social judgment ini udah pasti kalau teman-teman kalau saya dibilangnya normal saya padahal nggak suka kata normal tapi kalau kemudian saya jalan sama Alexa ini diliatin 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 ya padahal buat saya Alexa sama saya sama normalnya sama pinternya sama cakepnya sama hebatnya ya tapi social judgment itu dari kecil itu ada anak laki-laki pakai baju pink dibilangnya banci anak perempuan main bola dibilangnya aneh ya itu social judgment kemudian no safe space for sharing stories itu udah jelas jadi anak muda jadi remaja di Indonesia susah bener ya apa yang terjadi kalau yang tadi semua nggak ada yang handle pernikahan yang tidak diinginkan pernikahan ini pernikahan anak masih ada masih ada udah direncanain malah nanti kalau anaknya gede jangan kemana-mana nikahnya sama saya ya itu masih ada anotet pregnancy udah pasti ya saya SMA melihat sendiri depan mata saya teman SMA saya hampir lima bulan masih dikasih izin ikut ujian tuh udah keren banget sekolah masih kasih izin ya tapi sekolah lain mungkin tidak melakukan hal serupa drug abuse penyalahgunaan ya kemudian infeksi HIV dan STI teman-teman kelompok muda pasti punya datanya sekarang makin banyak kenapa karena nggak ada yang ngasih tahu nggak ada yang ngasih tahu bahwa oke okay, kamu sudah besar kamu punya kebutuhan biologis kamu harus apa sebaiknya jangan apa kalau memang sudah ada di depan mata harus apa bagaimana mencegahnya itu nggak dikasih tahu juga membesarkan anak dalam usia muda saya ya saya baby lagi baby lagi banyak contohnya saya sama baby ya mental health ini jadi persoalan yang sekarang sangat kritikal banyak banget anak muda yang depresi dan stres alasannya saya nggak ngerti kenapa nggak bahagia nggak pernah ngobrol mungkin sama orang tuanya sama temannya sibuk masing-masing sama sosmed ini juga bisa jadi dampak kemudian balik lagi social judgment dalam kasus saya ya saya menikah umur 19 saya melahirkan anak di usia 20 saya terinfeksi HIV pada usia 22 tahun di saat semua teman saya bisa sekolah, bisa traveling, bisa jadi sarjana, bisa kerja, bisa happy, saya happy. Tapi saya harus ngadepin ini semua. Kalau tindakan preventif dilakukan sejak jauh-jauh hari, sejak zaman SMP bukan cuma pelajaran biologi yang ngasih tahu textbook saja, tapi pembahasan secara mendalam, mungkin saya mikir lagi mau berhubungan seks sama pacar saya. Tapi itu tidak terjadi. Oke? Okay? Saya nggak bakal curhat, nggak bakal nangis, lewat. Ya, apa yang kita butuhin saat ini? Ini yang dibutuhkan di Indonesia. Pertama, saya saya sering banget ngomongin soal sex education, sex education di sekolah, di rumah, di kampus, dimanapun tempat yang mengaku sebagai lembaga pendidikan kasih dong informasi. Ya, dinas pendidikan tutup mata, katanya nggak boleh sama dinas. Eh, sorry, Kementerian Pendidikan tutup mata, katanya nggak boleh sama Kementerian Agama. Kenapa sih nggak boleh ya? Bingung saya. The prevention, pencegahan dari penyalahgunaan ya. Kita butuh banget informasi itu. Ada informasinya, tapi informasinya selalu menakutkan. Bener nggak? Kalau orang pakai drugs, pokoknya begini, begini, begini itu selalu jelek aja, buruk aja. Padahal sebenarnya yang salah bukan orang yang pakai, menurut saya. Ada sesuatu di balik itu di belakang itu yang harusnya dari akarnya diselesaikan. Kemudian mental health treatment juga harus sudah mulai dikerjakan. HIV prevention sudah pasti. Ini harus sudah mulai diomongin dari ranah sekolah tadi dokter siapa ya? Ah, Pak Santoso ngomongnya. Anak saya sampai hari ini kami sangat menyembunyikan satu HIV-nya. Ini karena forum belajar saya selalu terbuka. Kemarin tiba-tiba anak saya ada yang tanya, ibu kamu HIV? Ya? Kenapa? Karena ada sosial media. Tiba-tiba ada yang tanya, emang anak saya pintar ngeles? Dia bilang, enggak, ibu kok aktivis. Dia jawab, kenapa? Aku harus bohong nih, aku minta maaf. Karena aku tidak mau terjadi seperti yang di Medan. Dia lihat berita. Dia sendiri merasakan. ya. Jadi tindakan preventif itu harus dilakukan sejak dini. IP insya Allah tahun depan, kita sedang menyusun modul komunikasi orang tua dengan anak 